Coming up on Digital Music Trends 205, recorded on the 22nd of October 2014, Maverick wants to shake up management, Playlists.net sold to Warner, AT&T dropping beats, Apple considering a lower price point for subscriptions, Spotify launches a family plan, Twitter's new audio cards and a new site for Lior Coins 300 Entertainment. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Leonelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and DMT is available on a wide range of uh, streaming services, uh, many of which enable you to subscribe to the show, but if you'd like to receive a weekly mail out instead that lets you know when the shows are out, uh, you can subscribe on bit.ly slash DMT list. Again, it's bit.ly slash DMT list. And this week it's a real pleasure to welcome two great guests. Uh, so first up, it's uh, Kyle Blinn who just recently joined uh, Soundhound as a UX researcher and released a book on the music industry called Promised Land so more on that later so hi Kyle how's things thanks for joining us Things are going great. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to have you. And uh, next, it's a real pleasure to welcome Christopher Moon, uh, Chris Moon, uh, Head of Curation and Content at Noise Trade, Manager of uh, Afix Manor and a Teacher at Berkeley Music and McNally Smith. So hi, Chris, and thanks for joining us. How's it going? Oh, it's going great. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to have you. And uh, this week, we have quite a few stories uh, uh, propping up uh, and uh, a few sort of stories about management, which I don't really know much about, but we'll uh, try and nav navigate our way through it as best as we can. And uh, of course, uh, your, your, your support is going to be greatly appreciated on those. And, and the leading story that I want to open with this week is in the in an area that, again, I'm not uh, much of an expert in uh, artist management. So Billboard broke the story that Guy Oziri, the, the manager of uh, U2, uh, Alicia Keys and Madonna, has just launched a new management group called Maverick, where he is joined by other management heavyweights, uh, including uh, Lafitte Management's uh, Ron Lafitte, uh, I am others, uh, Karen Vizi and Blueprint Groups, uh, Re, uh, Guy Robertson and, and a, a bunch more. And so essentially Maverick will be a live nation company, uh, essentially but to, by all extents and purposes, and aims to make strides in uh, music uh, enjoying the music with technology and looking beyond uh, uh, traditional opportunities uh, that music management uh, usually got stuck with. Uh, so Oziri has a, a great deal of contacts in tech. Uh, he has a, a fund called A Grade uh, that he runs with uh, uh, Ashton Kutcher uh, and uh, uh, billionaire uh, Ron Burkle. Uh, and uh, together they've invested in companies like Airbnb, Uber, uh, Spotify, and SoundCloud, amongst others. There's about 20 companies they've invested in now. Uh, and so, you know, on the one side, we have a story, a story about a consolidation under the umbrella of this Maverick group uh, and on the other side we have a story around uh, sort of technological innovation and the fact that these managers want to implement uh, new things and break new ground when it comes to connecting artists with technology so uh, what I'm left with here is sort of wondering as some of the readers in the comments and section of Billboard stated whether this news is of any consequence uh, to the music scene at large of course we're talking about the 0.5% top of the music industry here uh, and, and so I want to hear you, you know your thoughts you know, what, what do you make of Maverick? What do you make of this move? And can innovation and change really come from, from the top? Uh, Kyle, what are your thoughts? I'll be curious to learn more about it in the coming months and to see what they actually do rather than hear about who they are. Yeah. Um, like you said, it's, it's a bunch of managers coming together under the Live Nation label, representing major artists, and they're looking to explore other avenues that... Uh, alone they could e equally explore but together they might hold more weight in so whether that's technology investment or branding and advertising or some kind of uh, uh, partnerships with uh, technology players uh, we'll see what they end up doing but right now it's really big on the the sort of gloss and the the launch of the thing and not much into the actual insight of what they're going to be doing on the day-to-day -day and what this might mean for uh, the overall industry. Uh, I kind of see it from a different perspective. Um, I think it's fascinating to see how everyone, even at the top echelon of the industry, is moving away from the kind of uh, touchstones of the industry, if you will. It's like, obviously, there's no money in record sales. There's still money in touring. Uh, and all this is under the umbrella of Live Nation right. uh, to that degree. But the fact that there's the tech component uh, it it kind of it, it reminds me of the consolidation and the growth that happened with the uh, you know TV and film agencies you know years ago getting to a point where they're really bloated and they're pulling things together and consolidating in the same manner. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, whatever money you make now as an artist, you want to invest in something outside of the music industry, typically, uh, it seems like. So it, it seems like they're kind of presenting themselves with, um, you know, anchoring around the live component, playing around with the idea of what you can do as far as releasing music nowadays, i.e. kind of what you two did with, with Apple, obviously, and iTunes, and setting themselves up to have the best possible relationship for brand connections and investments outside of the industry. I, I, you know, I think as an independent manager working with a band that's on Merge, I just, you know, this isn't even in my stratosphere of really a concern per se. Uh, but I, I kind of just see it as, you know, wow, it's hard for these folks to do anything nowadays that they have to pull all their resources together <laughs> and look for opportunities outside of the industry. Right. You know, uh, it, it does kind of, you know, if you mirror that with the fact that we don't, haven't had a platinum selling record by a single artist this year. Um, you know, and a dip in digital sales in general, you just, you, you know, the record industry in itself is, is shifted and changed. Uh, and I think the one good thing for them collectively is they'll hopefully be able to leverage their quote unquote star power elements, both as within the industry and within the community at large with these artists as brands themselves and, and build and grow outside of the industry itself. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think it's a smart move overall, but it is a non-event in a sense that I agree with Kyle. It's like until they can show that they can do something uh, with that collective power, um, I don't. I don't really see. It's, it's hard to gauge exactly, you know, if that's a success or not. Um, so, but yeah, it, it's it's a smart move for for people of that ilk for sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was kind of sniggering when you said, you know, they're having a hard time, right? At the same time, you know. It is a, a, a truth of, of the sort of the the, the hypersphere of of uh, record uh, the record industry with the, with the megastars that they're not selling uh, the the records that they were selling uh, even like three three or four years ago and uh, yeah. the issue here seems to be that uh, from from a campaign perspective it's just really hard to pull together the budgets to. Uh, promote the records at this point you know that's why you two did the partnership with apple they didn't believe that the record might uh, sell uh, particularly uh, by itself i saw another interview with them on, on the graham norton show in the uk and, and they <coughs> essentially reiterated mm. the same point they didn't really know if people wanted another u2 record and so they went with the apple uh, with the apple deal uh, and so in that sense maybe it is a problem for these mega managers because uh, if they don't pull together, if they don't find alternative solutions, there the just isn't the budget to promote a release like Madonna's new record. Is that? Do you think that's a concern? I think so. I think the biggest lesson from what you two did with Apple is, you, you know, it's a push. It, you, we used to live in a push uh, environment where you would just do what they did, push it out there, assume people were in, would be interested if you made it available. Uh, but we're really in a poll society at this point, you know. I mean, it, it, does somebody want a new Madonna record? If they do, they'll go out of their way and seek it out, you know. I don't want it to show up in my iTunes folder, you yeah. know. Um, so, but, I mean, how do you even create enough of uh, a media sensation story to make it really work right. um, when you're at that level, you know? And there's only so much you can do. Um, so I, I think I think the kind of combination, if you look at, like, Jay-Z and Samsung, um, you know, you two and Apple, it's like they're, they're, they're going outside of the typical music industry, typical media outlets, and trying to create an event around something uh, in a manner that draws attention, you know? I think it's a play for, for media exposure, um, mirrored with uh, a desire, you know, kind of a, a probably somewhat honest desire to just get their music out in an, in a, a disruptive industry that people just don't know um, how to navigate anymore. Yeah. So I like the idea that people are trying things. I totally applaud that uh, on all sides. Um, but I, you know, it is kind of scary when you think about it. In a way, you know, if these people who used to be able to uh, support themselves and support an industry, a little cottage industry around them are having issues and can't figure this thing out and are trying new things. How do you take, um, you know, an artist that would sell a fraction of that typically um, that can't get that level of media attention? Um, you know, where, where do they connect with and where does all that intersect as far as uh, just getting above the noise floor? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's, so that's an interesting, a lot to ponder. It's an interesting problem there to, yeah, to, to ponder. Uh, and I guess even if the article was a, 
uh, fairly overblown as far as the sort of uh, fanfare that uh, that it opened with uh, and, and, and the opening paragraphs especially but uh, it does raise an interesting point around, around the industry on, on that side and uh, uh, moving from management to tech which is uh, the, the land we were more comfortable with uh, probably uh, and we learned last week that playlist.net the UK based uh, playlist sharing service uh, that some some might still remember as share my playlist if we haven't used it in a while has been acquired by Warner Music Group and one could understandably wonder why would a major label want to acquire a site that that essentially uses music uh, 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 from all sorts of different labels, of course, and not limited to uh, Warner Music Group's music, and, and neither will they be limited to that kind of music in the future. Well, it seems like it's a placement uh, uh, issue. You know, Universal has done a similar thing with the uh, Digster project. Uh, they are looking at uh, uh, building a, f- a fan base of people that are following their playlist, and then they can drop uh, tracks that are by Universal or, you know, in, in the future, potentially on, on Share My Playlists, on, I'm sorry, playlists on that, uh, tracks that are by Warner into that fold, and sort of start promoting new artists through that uh, you know the financial tr- details have not been disclosed but playlist.net had, had only raised about 600k uh, so it was still a pretty small uh, company and, and I would imagine that the, the transition would uh, the transaction wouldn't have been that uh, onerous for uh, Warner Music Group overall uh, um, you know, Kyle, for, from from your perspective, uh, do you feel like uh, it's kind of? Do you agree with me that it, it does make sense some, somewhat for a, a company like Warner to acquire a service like Playlist.net, or would you have preferred uh, for Playlist.net to go to a player that could have used uh, the, the the content in a more neutral manner, in a sense? Um, it depends. I mean. Any home for a music tech startup <coughs> is a good home, especially if it allows them to continue doing their work. Right. Um, it's been a crazy summer for music tech. There have been a ton of shutdowns and acquisitions, and some people got acqui hired, some people got jobs, some people took over other people's jobs. Um, <laughs> so to see that it looks like they're going to keep the site going and allow them to continue building playlist.net is really cool. Do I think it's interesting that they see potential for seeding the playlist with their music and stuff? Uh, yeah, I, I feel like the reach can't be so big that it would make a significant impact on the distribution of new songs, but that could be one avenue. Right. Um, furthermore, I mean, just seeing the general fallout of the original dream of all the Spotify app ecosystem and how almost none of those have panned out to be real businesses and many of them aren't really around anymore. Right. Um, so it's, it's kind of sad to see the evolution from 2009 until now where there was this great hope that we would build something on top of Spotify that opened up the experience and created new uh, features in the platform essentially turn into uh, not really being a success. Many of these people that went head first, you know, now finally getting out, and just seeing the evolution of Spotify going kind of in a different direction, really. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's a very good point. I think. Uh uh, any home for a, for a company of this kind is 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 great to see that they are going to continue operating and uh, I know uh, that's my f- they're my first port of call when I'm going to a conference for example and trying to find a playlist uh, of bands that are playing at that conference so uh, they have a lot of uh, interesting users uh, uh, Chris uh, on your end uh, what do you make of uh, uh, this particular acquisition but also of uh, the, the the future of these curation companies in general because uh, there seems to be a, you know this year we've seen a race to acquire uh, you know uh, these type of companies in order to to have uh, a hand in that space, uh, but uh, will that continue going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of uh, interest. uh, Like when I talk to my students in particular in class, uh, it seems like there's a lot of interest in playlists, like they're getting turned on to newer artists um, through that avenue. So to that degree, uh, I feel like it's probably on a couple of different levels a good play for Warners in a sense that uh, they can view it as an A&R source, on, maybe to some extent. Uh, they can push stuff out and see kind of what kind of traction and reaction it gets. Um, and because it's in the tech industry, but yet still in the music field, I mean, yeah. who knows? If it were to build and grow, and if they uh, p- purchased it at a, a level where they could turn a profit on it at some point, it's a good overall investment. Um, I mean, I think... I think it's interesting that companies, the record companies now are investing in properties like this instead of investing in developing artists. Um, you know, I mean, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that was the investment they make. Now they'll, they'll leverage their catalog for a hefty advance from anyone that wants to open a streaming service yeah. and take some equity in that 
And guess what? If they sell that, they don't have to share that as royalties. It's actually, you know, uh, pure profit for them, essentially, uh, on the backs of the catalog they own. So until the courts prove uh, otherwise, <laughs> until the courts, yeah, and, you know, and, until until you go through the court system on twenty years later and get sued. Yeah. Um, and half a payout. So it's yeah, it's one of those things where you know, I mean, I think these companies are looking at it, going, it, you know, this is in our wheelhouse. This could we can spin it in a way where we could maybe pull an artist or two out of there from an A and R source, and who knows, maybe we can we can grow it a little bit and sell it for yeah. a profit at some point. Yeah. Um, it's it's probably a wise investment to that extent, especially if you can get it at a rock bottom price. Sure. Um, no, and it, it makes it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I, I think you know. Kind of, this story links very much, very well to uh, the story about uh, Google Play Music and songs. That. So, uh, you know, we mm -hmm. talked about this uh, earlier this summer at length, the fact that Google had acquired uh, uh, songs and intended to integrate that within the Google Play Music experience. Uh, so, uh, of course, strong, uh, songs a strength. Uh, if you're a listener of the show, you will know that it's it's in its expertly curated playlists, uh, which were mm -hmm. actually handcrafted by uh, actual, uh, you know, DJs or musicians or people that worked in the industry any, anyhow. And, uh, you know, they provide listeners with a, a curated experience uh, that corresponded to certain moods uh, certain activities and uh, over a variety of different genres as well so if you were in the park in the morning it may have presented you with a, an, an indie playlist a dance playlist uh, an acoustic playlist uh, according to you to what you wanted to listen to and uh, uh, now Google has actually integrated uh, the songs that playlists within uh, the Google Play uh, music <laughs> experience uh, uh, you know the um, the actual recommendations only happen in the US and Canada right now uh, even though the uh, a listen now page is available in all 45 countries where Google uh, Play Music is available so it's a bit of an experiment uh, for now restricted to North America uh, but uh, it, it seems like uh, an interesting way to use this playlist because of course uh, Google Music uh, Google Play Music uh, subscribers uh, are subscribing to an on-demand service and so they can cache uh, those playlists instead of uh, uh, being restricted to the songs that style mode of listening which was an internet radio one they can skip tracks they can uh, delete tracks of the playlist if they want to and so uh, a much more interactive experience experience there. Uh, Kyle, uh, do you feel like this is something that, that might catch on? You know, do, do, how do you feel about your current service, uh, streaming service of choice? I use Spotify. I don't really use those recommendations for day, evening, night, listening very much, but uh, do you feel like people might? Um, with this, I mean, obviously songs is getting songs is sort of core feature music concierge and the content that they curated under it is getting more distribution uh hopefully to a wider global audience yeah and that will take this sort of niche idea of the right kind of music for the right time of day uh and bring it to a wider group of people and i think that's a a, a positive thing for music listeners overall because i think when you get into the more mainstream market that is how people tend to listen to and discover music it's really based on their mood it's based on their activity and having something in the background that uh sort of accentuates that rather than tries to take the foreground right um in terms of uh you know songs of finding home a home at google i mean uh, google's getting really smart product people to take on you know their music experience and hopefully improve upon it yeah and i'll be curious to see if uh that gets them more traction in the market as they continue to add these assets to it and the people focused on it i don't know if we've seen any numbers on how many people are using google play music uh or the all access service yeah um but certainly being baked into the android platform can't help but they also lack, you know, the sort of 10 years of built-in habits of I click on iTunes, that's where I get my music, I plug it into my computer, it goes into iTunes, and it, it syncs perfectly. I mean, some people that have Android phones don't even understand that you can buy music through the Play Store on it. I've had to show them, right? <laughs> so it's, it's important not to uh, overestimate where the real market is in actual reality in comparison to the speculation that's happening in the tech sphere. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and the other thing to, to say is that uh, we can't discount the fact that Google Play Music uh, 
might very uh, quickly uh, merge or be uh, essentially tied to a YouTube music streaming service that we haven't yet seen and we haven't really heard anything about it uh, over the last couple of months so there have been a couple of, uh, a couple of pieces uh, coming out that questioned whether uh, YouTube hit some stumbling blocks with it what, what's happening why haven't we seen anything come out if the deals that they said were in place uh, are in place and so uh, we may well see this kind of playlists uh, sort of make their way into a, a YouTube type experience at some point once uh, the service goes live. Uh, Chris, uh, you know, anything more to add on this story or uh, on, on, on your thoughts around uh, the delay uh, of, of the YouTube music service? Sure. I mean, <clears throat> I, I, I've loved songs since it launched. I, you know, I, I definitely prefer it over Pandora or any other recommendation service uh, as far as the kind of mood uh, aspect goes. Um, but I've honestly never purchased or bothered to use anything within Google Play. Right. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I think these are these kind of synergy aspects are good. I think it does lean into the idea of that kind of curated playlist. There's a certain segment of people that, that you know, appreciate that uh, aspect. Um, so within that little ecosystem that, you know, Google has with Google Play, this will probably be a nice, nice little boost for Songza. It'll help them out in turn to some degree. But yeah, until there's some um, kind of combo play with YouTube or until Apple figures out what it's doing with Beats, it's, it's hard to, getting back to what Kyle was kind of touching on and alluding to, it's, it's hard to even understand, like, is there enough room for all these things? Yeah. Is there enough people utilizing these platforms to make these things really, you know, truly matter uh, over time? I mean, that's, and, and I guess time will only tell to some extent. Uh, yeah. You know, I have a tendency, you know, you mentioned you use Spotify. I've been a fan of RDO just from the user experience uh, since the beginning. But every, and I tried Beats when it came out and I was like, I like elements of it, but I still, I don't know, for whatever reason, I still liked my experience on RDO enough that I'd rather, you know, separate the two and go to songs uh, if I'm in a, you know, I, I'm just going to like, good music to cook to or something you yeah. know uh and then if i wanted something specific i'd go to audio for it i didn't need that combination um but i don't think anybody's cracked how to combine all of that into into one things beats wasn't that for me in particular personally but i also you know utilize audio knowing that there's a good chance it'll it'll be like betamax or something and <laughs> eventually somebody will buy it or somebody will squash it out and something else will win so, uh, but I like, I like the experience now. Uh, and, I'll, you know, I think uh, the people that utilize Google Play and have an affinity for playlist will appreciate the songs integration over yeah. time. Um, but we're still, we're still, I think, months or even a year or two away from how uh, Apple and Google figure out how they're going to combine all these things in an effective manner. And somebody turns a switch on and all of a sudden, hopefully, the idea is hopefully enough people will come to the table enough um, to warrant the ability for this to kind of really kind of take hold on some level. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's a market where there's going to be a lot of stabilization happening next year. And, and I guess the services that we're expecting this year haven't quite come to fruition, so we're going to have to wait yeah. another few months to see how, how the evolution actually uh, takes shape. Uh, and uh, okay, Kyle, I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, SoundHound and sort of, uh, you just started uh, over there, but uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, with the move and everything, how, how did it come about and, and uh, are you enjoying it at the moment? Yeah, I mean, it's it's only my second week in the Bay Area. Right. <laughs> uh, everything's a little bit different than uh, Los Angeles. Uh, in terms of SoundHound, it's it's a great company with really smart people. It's you know extremely interesting going from sort of a a blogger to chart manager to uh, sort of live music researcher to now focus on a music app at a music startup. Obviously, SoundHound is more established and. Uh, has reached the sort of bigger technology startup phase. Yeah. Um, but it's great to contribute value to the team and uh, learn about the inner workings of SoundHound. I mean, it takes a lot of things uh, to make a simple app like that go around. And I learn something new every day. Absolutely. And, and if uh, people that are listening to the show wanted to know a little bit more about the company, uh, the interview is a little out of date. I recorded, I think, a year and a half ago at South by, but you can uh, go and find the interview that I did with uh, uh, Katie McMahon uh, at SoundHound uh, uh, back in South by 2013. And that, that contains a lot of good info on the company. And, and in terms of your book, actually, uh, do you want to talk about it? You know, uh, is it out officially now? <laughs> 
Uh, the book is out officially now. So awesome. the book that I released is an essay collection called Promised Land, Youth Culture, Disruptive Startups, and the Social Music Revolution. Uh, it contains essays that I wrote about the music and technology industry from about 2008 uh, to 2013. Um, it's been interesting to sort of be part of the conversation that long because, you know, when I started music writing, I was essentially uh, a, a grocer at Target uh, contributing to HypeBot after hours, and I turned that into a full-time role editing HypeBot, and you know, then essentially climbed my way from Fargo, North Dakota, where I, where I lived at the time, uh, to Los Angeles working at Billboard Magazine and Charts and Live Nation Labs in uh, consumer research and product strategy. Uh, kind of at the epicenter of the music industry. So it's it's equally this journey of uh, kind of a 20-something a digital native trying to figure out what's happening in the music industry. Uh, but it also almost sort of chronicles the evolution of me as a professional as I enter the music business myself and become uh, more aware of the sort of inner workings, the technology companies, their business models, and what they might mean for the future of music uh, beyond just my uh, experience as a fan. Awesome, and uh, I am halfway through it. I'm really enjoying it, so I'd recommend people go and check it out. It's uh, uh, you can find it on Amazon, and it's called Promised Land. And uh, uh, Chris, on your front, uh, I, I think I would love for you to uh, chat uh, ch chat with us for a few minutes about a uh, noise trade because I'm pretty sure all the people that listen to the show know about it. But uh, uh, in case of you know, for listeners in Europe or in, in Asia, they might not be as obvious as to what you guys do. So uh, can you mm -hmm. enlighten us a little bit? Sure. Uh, Noise Trade to me is, you know, kind of a platform for artists to share music and find new fans. And it's a, a great platform for fans to find new artists. Uh, and we kind of break the wall down in a sense that um, in, in offering up music for free, it's an exchange of email and zip. So that, and that goes directly to the artist or the label, depending on circumstance. And that gives them an opportunity to diver develop and nurture a relationship long term um so i mean for from the artist perspective it's really great because it, we, we have a, a pretty strong captive audience that is very uh engaged and very interested in finding and hearing about new music um it's currently at 1.3 million so we can take wow. an artist that nobody's heard about you know and just starting out rather and help them you know kind of kickstart an email list or we can take an existing artist um, this well-developed, uh, say, a band like Fun, who utilizes us to put out, you know, B-sides and live material, and that's a way for them to literally grow their list in the same kind of way, you know, um, and, and have something to kind of lean into beyond the radio play they, re you know, receive and and whatnot. So it's 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 a good environment. It's a fun environment to play in, and it's in a. It's well, thankfully we're in a situation where. Um, that that exchange is still uh, unique uh, by and large. As far as I, I feel like everything's moving more towards the data component yeah. in general, and that's more important. Um, you know, I mean, you could you could argue that the the real currency nowadays is that email address versus that you know one or a seventy cents you net out from a digital download. But um, you know, even the amount of data that a company like a Pandora or you know, somebody like that would share uh, is still very limited and probably will continue to be limited for a while. So I feel like we, we kind of fill an interesting gap when it comes to marketing and connecting as particular developing and emerging artists with new fans. Absolutely. Um, so, and and uh, check, yeah, out, so check out noistrade.com. I would uh, highly recommend it. There's a ton of uh, free, uh, great music. And so uh, yeah, definitely go and check it out. And if you are an artist or a manager, uh, you can also consider it uh, for, your, for your next release. And uh, thanks so much for that. And uh, sure. uh, next, I want to talk about Spotify. No, Spotify, no. Let's talk about AT&T and Beats. Uh, so, because um, that leads me <laughs> to the Spotify story. So <laughs> it's messing up my mental order, <laughs> which is never a good thing. Uh, so it looks like uh, the partnership between AT&T and Beats Music has come to an end. Uh, so I had first noticed the news on Mac Rumors. Uh, and that was actually, actually maybe like eight, nine days ago. They first post posted the story because uh, I had reports from Mac, Mac Rumors users that uh, it was no longer being uh, offered in AT&T stores. This is essentially now being confirmed by a bunch of sources. that uh, AT&T has taken the offer off the table, uh, although uh, customers that are already signed up are continuing to receive uh, the service that they signed up for, which was the 
14 or 15 or 16 dollars uh, per month uh, to cover to cover a family a household uh, up to five people uh, now uh, you know, so that's one component. This sort of a potential split uh, between AT and T and Beats Music, of course, uh, uh, probably caused by the Apple acquisition. And uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, we have Recode claiming that the company, uh, meaning Apple in this case, is looking at potentially trying to lower the subscription uh, fee uh, uh, that has to be paid monthly to five dollars when Beats Music relaunches as part of the company offering at some point early next year. And so, uh, according to Recode, which heard this from people that had been pitched uh, the idea from Apple. Uh, you know the, the the claims are that because Apple's best customers only spend around sixty dollars a year, uh, it would make sense for the company to charge five dollars a month, and also it would mean that essentially everybody that pays for the uh, subscription service would become the best possible customer uh, for music uh, from iTunes. So it's it's kind of a convoluted uh, idea here, and also there's a lot of issues because uh, all the streaming services that are out today have m are sort of starting to get their uh, act in order when it comes to making ends meet and uh, you know we've seen Spotify just uh, just uh, turned a profit in the UK last year uh, at the ten dollar ten pound price point so if like if the labels agree to this five five dollar price point that would completely undermine uh, the work that uh, uh, has been done so far in convincing people that ten dollars is the, the, the right price to pay for music so uh, you know Either on the Beats Music and AT&T split, or on the on the new Apple rumors, uh, uh, you know, uh, pick pick the one that you think is most interesting. Chris, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, call me uh, cynical, but I, is there not a clause probably with AT&T uh, and Beats that if Apple bought uh, Beats, then that relationship would be severed, um, given Absolutely, the fact yeah. that there is always a contentious relationship between Apple and AT&T? Yeah. Um, probably, probably not the case, but nonetheless, I think that was an introduction element. You, when, you, when you launch a service like Beats, you need... Uh, some help and you know um, get to get uh, early adopters on board, yeah. uh, and it's nothing better than to you know uh, tether it to uh, uh, you know uh, uh, cell service. So I think it probably just ran its course to some degree. Yeah. Um, I think obviously with with Apple acquiring Beats, they're gonna you know Beats is in a place where it's gonna have its opportunity. Well, above and beyond that, um, I, I think what's the company that's that's uh, in partnership in the UK with Spotify? Uh, why am I forgetting it all of a sudden? The mobile company. Uh, mobile. Oh, it's uh, is it for ah? I haven't got. A, it's, I think it's Vodafone. I'm pretty sure it's Vodafone. Yeah, yeah I think you're right. So when yeah. that. You know, the, uh, all the uh, the pro when you mentioned the profitability for Spotify in the UK, a lot of that's part of that deal. So when their relationship ends there, it'll be interesting to see a year later where Spotify's at, or if that see you know if you see a, a dip in, in subscriptions based on that. Yeah. Um, I think from a consumer perspective, you like. I mean, th there's an attraction to having all that bundled and you know sorted in a in a special way. Um, but I don't. Nobody's been able to figure that out, you know, as far as long term goes, uh, based on the kind of posturing of, of everyone involved. Um, going to the fact that you know they're trying to lower the price. I mean, didn't Google lower the price of a single album when they started competing with Apple with iTunes? Essentially, yeah, but I think they were taking the hit though. Yeah, and then YouTube or YouTube basically said, "Hey, you can go and listen to anything for free." Um, so the fact that Apple wants to come in after they brought the price of a CD down to ten dollars and set that standard, they want to lower the subscription to five. Um, the problem is, is I don't know if anybody you know is necessarily if that's a big enough difference for enough people to adapt to utilizing it. You know, maybe five dollars with a combination of the what. 500 million people that yeah. <laughs> Apple has on file, you know, the credit cards on file, maybe that will cause people to change. I don't, I don't know. I mean, what are your thoughts, Kyle? I'd be curious to know. I mean, I, I, I'm just kind of ambivalent to the difference between five and $10. Like for a label, it doesn't, you know, I mean, the profit is gone anyway, but why should they bend <laughs> to the, the kind of posturing of these companies that want to drive things down? Um, it, it's, it's problematic. Uh, for, for the companies, but it's also confusing for the consumer. Well, I mean, I think many part, many smart people have suggested that lowering the price to around five or six dollars is what it's going to take for on-demand subscription music to reach the mainstream market. Um, mm -hmm. I don't disagree with that because, uh, as Apple is kind of hinting, 
the current price per year for subscription music, which equates to about $120, is about double what the most active consumers are paying per year for their entire music consumption. So in, in reality, getting your most prized consumers to spend double the money is probably asking normal people to spend triple or five times one times what they'd okay. ever spend on music. Most people probably spend nothing on music at all and having to get them to jump to $120 a year is probably a lot. Um, I'll be curious to, I don't think they'll ever let the price go down. And if they do, it'll be probably Apple eating the bill for the other $5. Yeah. Um, will that lead to more people signing up for a subscription service? I think so. I mean, I think if you combine the potentially rebranded Beats Music service distributed across all Apple devices for uh, entry level of, of $5 a month and you just tap a button and it automatically goes to your bill, With Apple I, think you for, you, I think you forget pretty quickly that you're subscribing to subscription music. And if you're enjoying it and they do a good job, uh, that's probably the price point that's going to be most affordable to the widest range of people um you know in the future maybe we'll see uh music movies and tv bundled together into a larger subscription package and then people just look at entertainment as a whole as a single line item rather than as all these separate services but we'll see no one has really done that yet and all of these subscription companies for the most part are still on the market to be acquired and it'll be interesting to see if someone like a Dish Network or someone like a, a larger telecom decides to actually acquire one of these services and bake that into uh, the services they provide regularly. Yeah. I mean, there's so many variables, right? I mean, we have the uh, Apple on one side that's trying to negotiate for the new Beats deal. Uh, on the other hand, we have Google that is uh, has negotiated for the YouTube uh, uh, music deal, but we don't know the specifics of, of well, how much that service is going to cost. Uh, uh, on the other hand, we, ha we have the fact that Apple ecosystem has usually been quite insular but with a streaming service uh, would they jump ship like they did with iTunes and actually launch uh, the app across Android as well in which case it would actually influence uh, how you know YouTube plans on, on, on pricing its own product if Apple has uh, uh, an app that provides subscription service on Android that uh, does it for five dollars a month so there's so many interesting questions there uh, as to how those two relationships uh, with the music industry in the middle will, will intertwine eventually. Um, yeah, and you you brought up a good point, Kyle, in a sense that I almost feel like the adoption would ha or the adoption rather would have to come from some consolidation of a bunch of different media types. Like if you, if you look at the success of like um, a Netflix or even Amazon Prime, there's like value in that, and people are willing to spend that money for video content that they couldn't possibly begin to really devour. Uh, you know, in, a, in an effective manner. But yet music is something you can experience in so many different formats and facets, but yet the value, the perceived value of music isn't even worth $10 for people or, in, in, you know, it might be worth five. Who knows? But I, I almost, I, I kind of agree with you, though, and I think it's an interesting perspective. If somebody could come in and combine the media uh, components, add music into that, and come up with a pricing structure that everybody felt comfortable with, that would be a, a great boost um, to the possibility of the reach music could have. Yeah. Uh, I would love to see that happen as a consumer for sure. And it would certainly be more healthy long term for the industry as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, talking about the pricing side, it's also uh, important to note that Spotify has rolled out a new family plan, which will enable uh, uh, up, uh, you to add up to four additional family members to your subscription at half of the usual price. So that was one of the big bugbears with Spotify is the fact that a family had either to share one account and then be constantly uh, pissed when or even a couple when, when uh, the other person was accessing the service and you were cut off uh, or they had to share out for a separate subscription for each person uh, in this case it's, uh, now I think a family of five is going to be charged uh, around $29 or $30 a month for US readers or 20, 30, 30 pounds a month for UK readers uh, which is a lot of money actually uh, you know uh, 
a lot more affordable for a couple for example it becomes 14.99 instead of uh, 19.99 uh, and uh, uh, i don't know it's going to be interesting to see whether people decide to shell out for the extra uh, one or two subscriptions or three subscriptions uh, and how many are actually prepared to pay an extra $360 a year for uh, the privilege of having their kids uh, listen to uh, digital music uh, i'm not sure uh, uh, either of you guys got kids or or, or would would think of adopting this kind of thing <laughs> I, I do, and my audio feed is littered with Frozen and pretty much anything my kids love to listen to, because that's what right. we listen to the most. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, I, when when Beats had the two accounts, I think for uh, I mean they kind of spearheaded this, and you know initially yeah, when exactly. they launched, and my wife and I both utilized it. and We saved a couple dollars. I mean, Audio has it too. I think we both have. We have two accounts for like seventeen bucks a month. Yeah. So you save two or three dollars. You know, I, it's one play to have, but I, I don't. You know, you're you're looking at a small facet of people uh, that'll spend that extra money to segment it out you know and then you look at it on the other side it's like wow you know uh netflix does that for free i don't have to pay i can get different segments within netflix for my kids uh and the shows they watch so i i don't know i i don't see it as a strong selling point really yeah. um that's personally. a great analogy actually by the way a great analogy with the profiles in 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 uh netflix because you know that's they, they are baking that into the price point that is Mm -hmm. to, to begin with but uh, Spotify obviously for licensing reasons probably couldn't do that uh, anyway so yeah <laughs> yeah uh, no, in interesting it does get expensive so we'll, we'll have to see if uh, people t take take them up on the offer but it's great to see it's there because I know that some people were complaining about uh, the lack of that and uh, 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 yet another uh, news on on, uh, on, on services uh, on the services front is uh, that Microsoft has launched a uh, uh, new app that is essentially an Xbox Music Deals app that every week will highlight 101 new albums and old classic albums that will be sold for about $2 per piece. So this is essentially, it feels like it's a play for Windows mobile consumers to highlight the fact that Microsoft does have a music store and to sort of drive people towards that. And hopefully as they start purchasing albums uh, as mp3s they will realize that microsoft also has a subscription store and ultimately subscribe to that uh, in, in 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 the end but i guess the, the play here is to educate people that are, are not yet buying digital music or are interested in it but they're not yet interested in the subscription or they don't know that xbox music has a service that sells music to to actually get into it i guess uh, uh, kyle uh, you know do you reckon that uh, there are a lot of Windows Phone users out there that don't know about uh, the service that might be interested in buying albums, or is this just another kind of strange offer? We've seen a few of these. Sony has done one a couple of months ago, uh, one of those weird sort of offers app that is not going to go anywhere. Uh, yeah, one, we don't know how many Windows Phone users are actually out there. <laughs> Two, of those Windows Phone users, we don't know how many are aware of the idea that Microsoft allows you to buy, buy and stream music and has allowed you to do it uh, since the days of the iPod and the Zune. <laughs> and three, is a daily deals app or whatever this is going to going to drive people into that store, give Microsoft their credit card and cause them to buy music. I mean, I think that's a, a pretty large leap. Uh, essentially, all we're saying is that music is now a loss leader in a store that is hoping to drive the adoption of devices that aren't adopted yet in a streaming service that isn't used. So <laughs> I, I think Love we're, it. Love it. So, some product manager has, has a really rough road ahead of them in terms of getting this to work. I mean, obviously, I wish them the best. And uh, they're really smart people. They're going for a really, really broad mainstream market, not like the early adopter techie crowd. And maybe there is a very smart slide deck somewhere that says the way to do this to get people in the thing is to offer them discounted music. Yeah. But it's still pretty, uh, pretty far fetched and they're grasping for straws. You know, something amazing is happening behind you for the for the, uh, for the, for the <laughs> people that are not watching the show. It's amazing. We've never had a window cleaner on the show before uh, in the background as a shadow. That is like... S s it's that like is, a, 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 somebody will put that in a modern museum of art. Yes, and it'll exactly. <laughs> that is just like adding so much production values to the show. It's, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, thanks for that. that, that that's very I cool. I should uh, open the window and add them to the show. 
<laughs> this is a better. This is a more important and more fascinating news item than what we were actually discussing. I think you reckon um, when it comes to uh, <laughs> Windows and Xbox. And, okay, and music. yeah, sure, yeah. no, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm joking, but yeah, seriously, uh, to Kyle's point, I think it's you're talking about such a small segment. Yeah, uh, it's just really hard when you don't when you can't wrap your head around what that is to know what kind of you know it's like yeah somebody built this up and it's awesome and it's a great thing to offer but is there enough traction within it that it's going to really move the needle in any kind of way um, I don't know it remains to be seen but it's this definitely uh, it's good to have but it's it's not essential in some respects I, I would say um, I mean my wife's an independent author. And I, I love, love looking at the, the music industry and comparing it to the book publishing industry because it's, you know, essentially five or six years behind uh, as far as the, um, the way consumers um, uh, interact with it. There's a lot of parallels, but, yeah. you know, she's had one purchase on Google Play but compared to the, you know, numbers of, you know, purchases on Amazon. So um, it stands out. It's great, you know, in that circumstance, but it's also like you want to make it available. Yeah. Um, you want to be on all these services, but it's really hard to gauge, you know, uh, what kind of traction you can really get out of it um, beyond the, the purpose of what it serves for that particular uh, company initially just to have as an offering. Yeah. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And, and uh, you know, moving, on, moving to a story that has got slightly bigger, uh, you know, uh, a slightly bigger impact on the on the industry as a whole. Uh, Twitter has launched a new way to listen to music on its apps, and so this is quite cool. It's called the Twitter Audio Cards, and it allows finally uh, it allows you to start playing a song uh, if if uh, the uh, a song is embedded as a Twitter Audio Card uh, from the iOS or Android app of Twitter. You can start playing the song, and then you can uh, essentially minimize uh, that. It will remain as an icon on the uh, right hand uh, bottom uh, of your screen and uh, you'll be able to keep listening to that song while you keep browsing or tweeting or doing whatever it is you want to do uh, so this is a, a cool new feature uh, the, the only bugbear that I have is that I tested it out but I then realized that it has been only rolled out to a few select uh, uh, you know megastars or the usual sort of uh, uh, famous Twitter people uh, to try out and it will be rolled out slowly uh, to the rest of the uh, Twitter uh, sphere so uh, I mean a little bit annoying when Twitter does that because they've done that with uh, when they launched uh, the um, uh, failed uh, music app and they rolled it out to the megastars first and then they sort of allowed the rest of people to download it but uh, I understand that things need to be tried out and so you know that's kind of unavoidable sometimes uh, uh, um, by the way this will work on SoundCloud and uh, with SoundCloud and iTunes uh, embeds to begin with so uh, f uh, Kyle you know this is an interesting thing, you know, just in terms of the, the experience uh, for people that are using uh, Twitter and, and audio. Uh, you know, c do you think it will lead people to listen to more music whilst on Twitter? It entirely depends on how much music they're following on Twitter, right? Yeah. Um, if that's not what people are putting out on their feed, it's going to be an, a non-event for them. I think, I mean, just seeing the evolution of Twitter's music strategy, you know, they had acquired We Are Hunted and they had rolled out that seemingly good app that failed to reach a wide audience and now going back to bringing the audio within their platform and partnering with the third parties like SoundCloud as well as rolling out the real time chart with a billboard yeah. uh, to kind of track the the chatter that way uh, it, it's interesting to see kind of how they've they've pivoted in their strategy and I'll be interested to see if it means something or nothing for music, but obviously music is hugely popular on Twitter. Artists are hugely popular on Twitter. So one can imagine that this can only be a good thing for people that use the platform in this way, but many people use Twitter for many different reasons. Yeah. And music is just one of them. Yeah, I can't disagree with that. And uh, Chris, uh, on your end, you, uh, are you a heavy app, Twitter app user? And, <coughs> and uh, would you would you use this heavily if, if it, uh, as and when it rolls out widely? Yeah, I, I could see the practical use of it on occasion. I think it's a great feature. There's certainly no harm in having that in the mix. Um, I mean, more recently, I was going through my feed a couple of weeks ago, and a new Damien Rice track was, you know, talked about on, I don't know, Pitchfork or something, and I clicked through. I had to go through a couple hurdles to listen to it. I mean, if yeah. I could have listened to it immediately there, that would have been nice. Um, I, you know, I don't know if it's crucial, but it'll certainly help um, to some extent. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think you'll see pretty good adoption for the people, you know, like Kyle mentioned, that actually use Twitter and follow a lot of music-oriented um, sites. I can see it for podcasts where it can, might be, you yeah. know, somewhat useful maybe, uh, new services for quick sound bites. Um, it's, it's a nice, nice little flourish, you know, to kind of have in there. Um, but yeah, I'd be curious to know the, the numbers say four or six months in as far as, you know, the amount of people, uh, I, again, you know, you can put that up there. I guess you can see plays through SoundCloud, but, uh, I, you know, I, I yeah, who, who knows? I do, I do get the sense that of the social media platforms, obviously Instagram is a great place to get a lot of engagement, even though it's a smaller group for most people, yeah. but between Facebook and Twitter, you're going to see more activity in this regard than you would probably on Facebook. So what, you know, if it's your, maybe not your most engaged, but your, your biggest platform to play with as an artist or a music company, then having this component is, is great. Yeah, man, I'm excited for the sure. podcast as well. I mean, I, try, I, I, try, I tried it out as soon as I read about it, but uh, then I realized that it wasn't open to everybody yet. So I look forward yeah. to uh, seeing whether uh, it's going to make a difference of, uh, in terms of how many people listen from Twitter to the show whilst doing other stuff and perhaps leave it on after they scroll past it. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to see. And uh, mm. uh, I think uh, the last item on my list was to just note, uh, make a note about about uh, 300 Entertainment, which was the uh, music content company uh, founded by Lear Cohen, uh, launching a new website and expanding uh, by hiring 16 new members of staff. So uh, 300 was essentially uh, last year's version of uh, the Maverick story, in a sense. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because again, it was... Uh, a, parallel. A, yeah, it was a, a big uh, sort of music uh, a muggle who had uh, decades of experience who uh, went into the partnership with uh, Todd Moskowitz and uh, Kevin Lil Lil Lils uh, and the company had a you know, $50 million war chest uh, uh, courtesy of investors like Google and Columbus Nova and they made a big splash of Medium uh, talking about a partnership with Media, uh, with Twitter where they would uh, essentially analyze uh, uh, Twitter stats and, and, and use uh, those for A&R purposes and uh, you know the company has uh, made a lot of signings including Alex Winston, Jackie Lee, Astor, and Raz Simone, uh, a bunch of a bunch more artists on the site, which is uh, uh, 300ent.com. Uh, the site now is, is pivoted towards uh, showcasing those artists. Whilst before it was more uh, sort of geared uh, t- towards showcasing the actual company itself and, and the management behind it. Um, so uh, Cohen also t- took part in a, an Ask Me Anything Reddit session uh, last night. It was uh, uh, on, on Wednesday, uh, the Tuesday night, uh, on the 21st of October, and he was asked uh, where he sees revenue news possibilities in the future and listed as number one uh, streaming as number two advertising as number three sales uh, uh, at number four auxiliary licensing and at number five sync so a few interesting points uh, from him there on where he sees the money coming from and uh, uh, but essentially, you know, this confirms that uh, 300 is not going anywhere. Uh, they had a sort of an a, a RIP uh, sign on the site, uh, which had led some to believe that something might be going wrong with the company. But actually, no, they were just uh, relaunching the site and uh, sort of making it uh, better for everybody and investing more in A&R. Uh, so once again, we're back talking about, you know, a big company that has got, is trying to find a different way in. But the interesting thing here is that we're talking about a company that's looking for acts that are from the bottom up. So okay, Okay, it might be a big pers- uh, you know a, a big personality that's putting this together uh, but uh, he's not relying on uh people that are already mega stars in order to make the project work he's actually looking to build new uh, artists uh, up so kyle uh on 300 uh, ha- have you heard anything about the company in the past year and then uh, how do you find their latest uh, move um i haven't heard a lot about them in the last year other than their initial splash at medem yeah um, you know, like you said, it's a really interesting case study happening where on one hand you have some, you know, very influential people betting on new acts. And on the other hand, you have a bunch of influential, influential people coming together and betting down on established acts. So, uh, the sort of viability of those business models, how they change over time, their different revenue streams. I mean, obviously, uh, they're going to be diversified. They're going to be different. And it'll be curious, like, you know, one, two, three years times, like, what kind of case study can be written about this company? Did it did it establish itself as a, as a new music company? And what does that mean? And is this model 
something other people could follow. Almost no one can really follow the Maverick model, right? I mean, yeah. there's other larger <laughs> uh, management firms that have kind of consolidated together, but they can't, if they don't represent those artists, they don't represent those artists. Um, could some other established label people or managers come together and try to replicate what 300 Entertainment is doing? Maybe. We don't know if that's uh, something that is uh, entirely onto them and what they're capable of executing, yeah. or if this is a new model of how things will look like in the future. Time will tell. Yeah. Chris, uh, do you, you know, do you, do you, uh, as Casa, do you, do you feel like perhaps the way that 300 is going about it is it might be more replicable in the future if it is successful and people might use it as a, as a, as a uh, model? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I applaud them from trying to use it as an A&R source and build and develop things out of it. I think, you know, it's one thing to take uh, a you know existing A-list artist and try to figure out the, and adapt to the current climate. Is a whole other thing to try to. I mean, there really is no quote unquote A&R or artist development um, really happening um, beyond what happens organically nowadays. Um, so any company is willing to get into that um, you know sandbox. I think. Um, I'm, I'm curious about and would be really curious to see the level of success they can achieve. The th thing that kind of scares me a bit is, is like, who's putting $15 million into a company like that when there's probably little to no revenue being generated? I mean, yes, it's somebody like Leo can, 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 you know, raise that kind of capital, but how often can that happen? Um, there's a bunch of platforms. I've been thinking a lot about this lately because, um, you know, Jack um, Conte's uh, Patreon, or however you pronounce that, you know, also raised millions of dollars. And I'm like, that's that's awesome. I love the same, you know, heartfelt kind of, you know, patron of the arts kind of mentality is awesome. But, I mean, where is the money? Like, how does this – I guess I'm just curious. I'd love to know – where their projections are and where the scales. How do you recoup a fifteen million dollar investment, <laughs> you yeah. know, in something like that in an industry that is quite, you know, sitting basically on a fault line? Yeah, um, you and know, I mean, Patreon, Patreon is a, is an open model and it's scalable in the same way as Kickstarter or Airbnb is, and it's not lim limited to music. That's so, true. So in that sense, it makes you know, it's not limited to the artists that you have signed, which is the main problem for that company. Yeah, yeah, but they're taking 10% of what is, you know, somebody else's generosity towards yeah. those artists. So how does, you know, it, it's, uh, and it's, and that's replicable too, to some degree. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not being critical of any, either one of these companies, don't get me wrong, because I really am fascinated and love it and totally support it. Uh, what I'm critical of or concerned about is the amount of money that's being invested into these, like, is it, a, is there a bubble potential that's going to happen where at some point, you know, these VC guys are going to go, oh, my God, we just literally, you know, dumped hundreds of millions of dollars in the music industry and got nothing for it. <laughs> you know, it's like, and then where does that leave us, you know? Cause, and it's interesting, too, because in the past, you would literally see these level, the Lear Cohen type levels, bounce around label to label. Yeah, exactly, uh, on million and, dollar and, salaries. And, and, and they would lean into their history, you know, and the industry itself during the CD era obviously could afford that. You know, EMI could go to Tom Zutat and give him a hundred million dollars to start a record label based on his personal taste. That doesn't happen anymore, you know. Um, and and so you're getting fifteen million from VC to start a company uh, based on the the track record of a CEO. But I mean, it's a it's a hard go. It's you know, I applaud him for for doing it. I just hope it doesn't back. I, I want to see a couple of these things really win from a financial perspective. Yeah. Um, I, I hope that you know that people aren't taking too much on the front end. I mean, really, if you look at Top Spin, I mean, what happened there yeah. at the end of the day? There was a lot of money invested in that, and it scaled on a certain level, but then flattened out. And you know, at some point, you're inve you got to assume that the investors are like, we want to see a return on what happened here, and we don't believe that this model is going to develop in the way that you know we all anticipated. So. Let's cut our losses and recoup what we can and move on. I mean, we can't have too many, you know, opportunities like that pass uh, yeah. at that kind of level before it becomes detrimental across the board. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a real concern for me, I guess, the way I look at it as far as where all this kind of intersects. I think if music is going to get above the noise floor um, and have an opportunity to penetrate, developing artists have an opportunity to lift themselves up and call 
um, themselves, you know, artists that have a career, there's got to be an influx of interest and cash from outside of the music inter- industry itself, yeah. uh, be it within other elements of the entertainment industry or beyond the entertainment industry, i.e. partnerships with brands. So with all that in mind, we need as many, we need less of the Samsung, uh, you know, uh, Jay-Z hiccups and more successes yeah. with something else that actually resonates and works in a manner that allows for, for that to happen. Yeah. Uh, so I'm I'm getting off point, but nonetheless, I just I want to see I, I want to see companies like this win. Uh, I'm just concerned about the amount of investment that goes into it initially. So sure. time time will tell. But uh, I, I applaud them. I applaud both of them on both sectors for making that effort. Uh, it'd be real easy to sit around and to say. Well, we'll do what we can do, and we'll see what happens. You yeah. know, or it's real easy for you too. For all the critical elements you can give to them pushing that out through Apple, it's real easy to sit and, and be critical of it. it. But but it would have been just as easy for them to not even bother and just go on the road and, and bank a ton of cash. Yeah, you know, at least they're making an effort. You know, <laughs> yeah, kind at of least they're making an effort. Yeah, exactly. To try to do something. You know, music music quality and and you know criticism aside. You know, I still applaud the progression. Yeah. Um, even even if it, you know, you got to make mistakes in life in order to uh, hopefully get on the right track. Yeah. So. And you mentioned you mentioned uh, Patreon. Uh, I would uh, probably mention that uh, Amanda Palmer has mentioned in her Facebook page that uh, she's considering uh, uh, jo- uh, launching up some sort of Patreon page. So it's going to be very interesting to see uh, an artist that has such a big grassroots uh, uh, sort of fan base online uh, how she will fare on it because there are people that have only a few thousand followers that are making uh, pretty d- decent money on it. And so it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, how she will do you know it, it could be a massive uh, another uh, interesting inflection point like the kickstarter was uh, a few years ago and that yeah. sorry no i was just going to say i think now that you mentioned that really quickly i think the reason it works for an artist like amanda palmer is she does a brilliant job of communicating in a very honest and natural level with her community yeah that's why she raised a million dollars on kickstarter that's why she could probably raise that tenfold on a platform like patreon just simply because it's not you can't replicate that yeah. um, as as a oh I can go and do that now because I have the same kind of you know numbers and metrics and data supports it no it's the relationship that yeah. requires that I'm not even a fan of her music but I am a completely a fan of the way she communicates with her her audience uh, I will see her on her book tour next month actually oh, nice. she's there in, in Minneapolis and. I, I bought a ticket and I'm like, I just want to go and watch that. I want to see, I want to look in the crowd and I want to watch her on stage and see that interaction. Yeah. That, that, that to me is more interesting and, and really more telling than any of the metrics and data you collect around it. Yeah. Um, awesome. We can learn a lot from that. Cool. Well, uh, thanks so much, guys. That was uh, great. It was great having you on uh, for the first time. So hopefully I'll have you on again at some point uh, in the next year. I'd uh, love to have some uh, guests come back if they want to. And uh, once again, sure. uh, for Kyle, uh, we were talking about a Soundhound. Uh, but, uh, so go and check that out. Uh, but you should also uh, go and check out uh, uh, Kyle's book, uh, which is uh, called... Uh, ah, sorry, I've just... Mr. Page. Uh, <laughs> it's called Promised Land. Yes, Promised Land. I'm terrible. Uh, Promised Land. And uh, <laughs> and for Chris, uh, you can go and check out Noise Trade on noisetrade.com. And also, Chris, uh, your band is called? Uh, Apex Manor. Yeah, they're on Merge. They'll hopefully have a record out again next year. Awesome. Um, for sure. And uh, I'll, I'll give a thumbs up on Kyle's book, too. Uh, I think it's it's really kind of him to uh, share that experience in the way that he did. Um, it's definitely encouraging for, for folks like myself who, um, you know, kind of grew up in the same kind of capacity and had a different route, obviously, but yet I can completely relate to it. And I think a lot of people out there can. Yeah. So for, for all this music industry geeks, it's, it's great to, to have an insight in, into your path. So thanks for that. No, yeah, and, and I, I look forward to finishing it. I was a late starter because I, I had a bit of a crazy six weeks in the past uh, few weeks. But uh, uh, yeah, it's it's uh, uh, I, I highly recommend it. And uh, thanks so much for listening. Uh, the show comes out every week. Of course, you can find it on digitalmusictrends.com. The next couple of weeks are going to be a little bit interesting because next week I'm heading to Bilbao for Bime on Wednesday night. So I should have time to record the show uh, during the day on Wednesday. And the week after, I'm going to be in uh, Dublin for the Web uh, Summit. Uh, and hopefully 
I'm going to get some interesting people uh, that are part of the music uh, uh, stage uh, to uh, come in and do a few bits that I'm going to release as a show for uh, that week. So hopefully uh, no interruptions to the show uh, due to travels, uh, but uh, thanks for sticking with us. Uh, have a fantastic week and until uh, next time.